Hi, I'm Debbie Mores, and once again, this is Legal Matters, the program that has been designed to address the critical and sometimes contentious issues facing businesses and consumers today. It's legal information, practical solutions, and straight talk, as we say, about a wide variety of topics that affect your work and your home life. We welcome once again from Audette Bazaar Cadero Grasso Law Firm in East Providence, Jackie Grasso and David Bazaar. Well, today we are going to talk about attorneys, ethics, discipline, misconduct, and they have been very gracious to um, take on the topic as such as it is. Um, how do you identify when there's been some ethical issues, and what can you do about it if it's affecting you? I think we probably want to set up uh, a little bit of background first. Um, we know that lawyers are human, they can make mistakes, and sometimes it might be a bad de decision, maybe it's an outright crime. How do you determine when there has been um, an ethical breach, and what is an ethical breach? Oh. Well, it can take many forms, yeah. right? So, take us, take us um, about it. <laughs> what we see a lot of, um, and it's true of any profession, um, but for lawyers, a lot of times it comes down to the handling of clients' money. Misappropriation. Uh, misappropriation of money. Money that's supposed to be held in an escrow account, what we call an IOLTA account, which is interest on lawyers' trust accounts, where the money is the client's money. The interest on those accounts goes to the Rhode Island Bar Foundation to pay for an, a variety of things, which we can talk about that at another time. But the whole issue is money in those accounts belongs to the client and is only supposed to be used for the purposes that it was put in there for. And sometimes lawyers, for whatever reason, get into difficult situations and don't use those funds as they're supposed to be used. Quite often what happens is the attorney, instead of putting the client's funds in the IOLTA account, will instead put it in his personal operating account, which is a real no-no in uh, practice of law. So one, the minute you deposit it in that account, you've, all, you've misappropriated those funds. Interestingly that you mentioned that, that was a very hot topic and recently in the news where one lawyer who's in Pawtucket had done that very deed mm -hmm. that you describe and managed to use that escrow account as his personal ATM. Obviously he had some personal issues, but that's not the client's problem and he's being um, handled. So that's one issue that goes on, but what are some of the other, let's, and we can talk about how they get disciplined, how people get disciplined, but what are some of the other issues that will bring someone um, into an ethical challenge or outright um, misconduct, misconduct? I've actually seen cases where lawyers sign their client's name. So that's right. So forgery, and they're the, not supposed to do that. An example of yeah. that would be the um, case is proceeded to suit. Mm -hmm. There are some documents that require the client's signature, not the lawyer's signature. And for whatever reason, the lawyer can't get the client. He feels pressed or she feels pressed. And if they sign their client's name to a document that requires the client's signature, that is an ethical violation. A breach of confidentiality, that's another ethical violation. Yeah. Um, not being forthright with your client, not telling them key information about a case. Delaying um, a case unnecessarily so the confidentiality issue mm -hmm. has raised some dilemmas for lawyers yeah. and there was not too long ago a case where a lawyer had been given some information or had some information uh, in a criminal case mm -hmm. about the guilt or innocence of somebody who was already locked up in jail mm -hmm. and what can he do with that information and the court actually allowed him under those circumstances where somebody was falsely imprisoned to come forward with some information that one might or might not have been able to argue was confidential. And what that attorney did was he sought an opinion from the Supreme Court before he right. did that, rather than just divulging the information. So the, right, if you have a question about an ethical issue, you want to dial your disciplinary counsel in your local state. And that's, you know, cover yourself, that's what they do. We get a written opinion and, right. you know. And I think we do want to talk a little bit later on about the social media that has now complicated your issues yeah. about confidentiality and mm -hmm. disclosure of information. But I understand that in our, in our state, as in others, there is an actual code of ethics that someone can access and there's a physical location where there mm -hmm. is a disciplinary board. Hopefully that's not something that you'd want to mm -hmm. um, press charges with. But what's the actual process if I think I just think that something that a lawyer did might be questionable. What is the process? Well, we have the rules of professional responsibility. You can, every state has them. 
Um, we're required to pass an ethics exam before we can even sit for the bar exam, which means we have to know our rules of professional responsibility. You can access them online. Um, if a client feels that um, there was a breach or some, something inappropriate happened, then they can go on the Supreme Court website and there's a, a link where um, they have um, um, a the link disciplinary to the disciplinary council. So yep. you can link into that right. and download an application. Uh, a, a form. There's a form yeah. that you file mm -hmm. with the disciplinary council mm -hmm. where you lay out what your complaint is. Mm -hmm. And then what happens from there is the uh, disciplinary council will respond to your complaint. He'll mm -hmm. probably then forward it to whoever the attorney is that the complaint is against so that that person has an opportunity to respond. Sometimes the complaints really are misunderstandings or other things that really don't rise to an ethical uh, mm -hmm. violation mm -hmm. and they can get resolved informally through that process. Sometimes if the disciplinary council feels after having the complaint and the response, it needs to go for further and it's brought before a board of uh, people who hear these complaints. Interestingly, there is an actual 120-page document at the Rhode Island Courts website, as you indicated, courts.ri.gov, public resources, disciplinary board, mm -hmm. and they can, someone could actually read about what the Code of Ethics is mm -hmm. and what um, it entails and what you should do to file, as you're indicating. They point out, though, in this um, 120-page document that, of course, there's an issue about burden of proof. And to address your point, David, which is there may be an occasion when you might have some debatable issue. And there's not really proof that someone did something that was unethical or really an issue of misconduct. So how do you go about proving or disproving when someone says, I think, let's not talk about fees right now, but um, the client, the lawyer didn't uh, really disclose everything in a timely manner. How is something like that processed? How would you actually go about vetting that? Well, what we have to do if, if just using it as an example, if, if I'm a subject of a complaint, we're required to respond to that uh, complaint within a certain period of time. We as lawyers have to keep a very detailed file and notes, whatever it is, to make sure that if there are any issues going forward, then we have to cover ourselves. Um, how do you go about proving it? You know, yeah. let's hope you have some backup um, evidence and some witnesses or maybe people in your office sign an affidavit if they can help. Exactly. Yeah, okay. But a lot of times, you know, either there's going to be some real ethical violation of the rules mm -hmm. that is easy to point to and it's not so much a question of proof but explanation. Sometimes it's not a violation. It's just, like I said before, a misunderstanding of something. Mm -hmm. And just going through that process sometimes can eliminate it. Sometimes no one's ever satisfied with what goes through the board. But um, in, there's a process that goes beyond the board. If there is a viable complaint that the disciplinary council wants to bring, that's brought to the board. And then the board reports its findings to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ultimately is the group that decides what the punishment should be and imposes that. At that point, if they do impose a suspension or a disbarment, then it becomes public. That's correct. Yeah. And there can be a public censure yeah. if it's uh, mm -hmm. something that they think needs to be brought to the public's attention mm -hmm. or some other kind of punishment. Um, short of a disbarment, even the suspension has to be made mm -hmm. public. Mm -hmm. That board, is it just and only at attorneys who, forgive me no. for saying this, might be inclined to no. just c take care of their own? It's no. So it's pretty well diversified. Right. There are a couple lay people on there. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's appointments the from people. the Supreme Court, yeah. um, and it's mm -hmm. a, a combination of uh, lay people, mm -hmm. you know, non lawyers, lawyers. Yeah. Uh, so it is not a stacked body, so to speak. Good to point out for someone. And I guess we should make it clear, too, if someone thinks that they have a, a legitimate complaint and they go through this filing process, there's no cost for them to do that, correct? Correct. No. The other thing, too, I think we should point out is we as attorneys have an obligation to report another attorney if we believe that there was some unethical, or some ethical violation. Because if we don't report it and later find out that we knew about it, then we're right, we're in the same boat. So, you know, we have an obligation. If we know of something, we have to report it. Would you have as to well the judges, too. Yeah. Yeah. Would you have to go through the same process of filing with that disciplinary board or, or not? Is um, there another yes. informal yeah. process? Well, there is. Um, as Jackie was pointing out about judges, if judges see something that they uh, don't think is right, the rules give them 
the opportunity to call if it's a you know a lawyer practicing in front of them in and, and question them about it and make sure that there isn't a violation and if that satisfies them that could be the end of the inquiry but if they're not mm -hmm. then they could forward a complaint just in the same fashion as any other person to the board mm -hmm. to the disciplinary council if someone thinks that they have a, a legitimate complaint let's assume first they're going to call that lawyer first and say what happened here I think this the lawyer gets to defend himself I think that and it doesn't get resolved then they the next step I assume was to file that complaint formally at the disciplinary board and you said that the lawyers will then get a copy of it and they get to respond mm -hmm. if they just at that point get to work it out um, and that misunderstanding or there mm -hmm. isn't really grounds for a legitimate complaint it, they may be unhappy or disappointed but that doesn't mean it's misconduct mm -hmm. um, if it ends right there does the lawyer then have an occasion to charge that client for taking up more of his time oh, and having to no. battle yeah. that that, that no. just adds fuel to the fire right now yeah. what you should also know I believe in today's economy and particularly a number of these issues revolve around fees yes and so there's also another process where there's a dispute over fees and that's through the Rhode Island Bar Association and they have a fee dispute resolution panel a mediation panel or arbitration panel I should say that can listen to the case and make a determination and if we have a client that disputes a fee then we immediately have to set aside those funds. Um, my my uh, experience is you should put it in a separate account, right. an interest-bearing account, and we're not allowed to release any funds um, until the fee arbitration is resolved. Are you referring to the funds that that client would have already paid uh, to your firm for having taken care of his case up to that point? Any any money we have on in an escrow that belongs to a client, whether it be from a personal injury settlement right down to hourly billing, if it's a retainer, hourly if billing too. Correct. Okay. If there's a dispute about a fee, we ourselves we can't pay ourselves. The money has to stay in either the escrow, or I think if, if the better way to do it is to put it in a separate interest account. Um, but uh, you, we're not allowed to touch those fees. Right until the panel who hears it makes mm -hmm. a decision one way or another as to who's entitled to what money from that. Yeah. Now, as you say, it, the fee situation isn't usually a misconduct unless someone is an outright villain, and let's assume that most lawyers are honest right. and do mm -hmm. absor observe the code of ethics such as they are. But and that's true, by the way. Yes. The vast majority are. There yes. are, yes. you know, as in any other profession, some bad apples, and that mm -hmm. taints mm -hmm. the barrel, so to speak. But yes, and, and yet knowing, too, that the in the news currently, there have been stories about some who didn't handle things appropriately. Um, if there's such a thing as um, we think that this uh, lawyer did something wrong, is it considered to be um, a major um, infraction if he's disbarred versus suspended for nine months? Oh, disbarment, right. it's, it's that just what it is. You can't practice at all. And what gives the you a reason to be disbarred versus not practicing for nine you months? You have to do something pretty egregious to such get as disbarred. Um, Having relations with a client, I think, is subject yep. to disbarment. Having personal relationships, or the romantic um, relationships. amount of violations you've had yeah. could also lead to uh, the court saying that you need to be disbarred. You know, if you have one violation and that's it in a long career, they're not likely to disbar you unless it's an egregious act. Yeah. Whereas, if you took a little bit of money and then you did it again and then you did it again, each one on its own might not have been enough to have you permanently disbarred, but the aggregate would. Yeah. If you did find, and I think you've said, uh, maybe you can give us a couple of examples, but if you did find one of your own, not necessarily in your office, but another lawyer who had done something that is questionable, never mind outright illegal, might you be inclined to say, uh, John, I think you shouldn't do this, this is really wrong, and if you don't fix it, I will thus and such, versus absolutely filing that, the complaint? That's really the first step. Yeah, yes, that is it the is. first step. And that's yeah. legitimate. That's yeah. not considering you being uh, in collusion or no, whatever. No, because here's the thing. If it's something, let's say a fee situation, yeah. where they have money of a client and they haven't turned that money over, mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do, and your client wants you to have done, is to get their money back. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you call them up and say, please, Please return the client money to them that's legitimately theirs and if they do that's probably resolved the issue anyway so if that's where don't. you start that right. would happen inside your own office perhaps though but you wouldn't necessarily know another law firm unless the law firm that's representing someone actually called you and said hey 
my attorney didn't thus and such, and you call them and make that sure happens, though. you do yeah. complete that circuit that You way. know, you can do something as uh, minor as refusing to return a file or refusing to forward a file right. to another attorney. In other words, if you hire, um, if you fire your first attorney and go to attorney number two, we have to have the client sign an authorization for us to retrieve the file from the first attorney. If the attorney in deliberately refuses to return that file within a reasonable amount of time, what's reasonable? Yeah. You know, yeah. who knows? But I mean, I've had situations where I've never even gotten a file, okay? Um, we couldn't find the attorney, whatever it is was. Is that complaint worthy? Oh, yes, it is. If they refuse mm -hmm. to turn it, usually what will happen is you'll get a little phone call from disciplinary counsel saying, hey, you know, so uh, this client called my office. They're wondering why you haven't forwarded the file. Come on, so and so, forward the file. Right. If it continues, and, and that's why the first step, usually because it hasn't risen to that level of yeah. an ethical violation until they don't follow up, is to make the phone call. And, and it's, I guess it stands to reason that any uh, organization that has the ability to self-govern and self-regulate should before it gets brought to a board and to a court and on and on and <coughs> all that. Now, if it does go to a court situation, does the, um, say it's the client challenging a lawyer, does that disciplinary um, counsel, do they provide a lawyer or are you uh, beholden or having to get another lawyer, pay another lawyer to sue the, your lawyer? How the, does that The disciplinary counsel is the one who's prosecuting the lawyer. So you don't need a lawyer if the counsel believes that there was an ethical violation. Okay, so they absolutely don't need to go find You the another. complainant. You the complainant. But the attorney should have oh, an attorney. Oh, the lawyer, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes, that's a different story. Right. We're, we're trying to support the client or yeah. the, right. the person who's the accuser right now. Um, about websites now, considering you're all entitled to have websites, apparently that and blogging and social media has opened up a new can of worms for you and others like you who have professions where you have to remain or keep your confidentiality. If someone is actually just emailing you and asking you about a case and you discuss that, does that put you in a bad place just in email? You're not retained yet. You're not betraying a confidence. At what point do you actually have um, to worry about what you say through your Facebook, your LinkedIn, or your email? Well, I wouldn't say anything to a client on Facebook, first of all. I wouldn't say anything to a client on social media. We do have a website where somebody can contact us directly via email. Right. So if we get an email and we answer an email to a client, the first thing we do is say, you know, well, I'm glad to hear from you. We're happy to meet with you in person. If we do dispense any legal information, I personally don't do it. No. You should put some kind of a disclaimer Always. saying, I'm not your attorney. You need to get legal advice. You know, if you're going to respond to a set of facts that have been given to you in an email. You would want to say, based on what I've been told, mm -hmm. but to really um, discuss this matter in some depth, you need to come in. Yeah. And sometimes you'll hear from someone, well, I'm in a different state or whatever. I can't come in. Well, then call me. Let's discuss it so that mm -hmm. there can be a back and forth, a, a dialogue on what the issues are, and you can really drill down to what the problem is and what the right solution might Even be. Even getting a phone call, too. Um, you know, I received one today where someone asked about my opinion on a case that is being handled by another attorney, and I said, you know, with all due respect, I don't represent you. Whatever I say to you is really not going to matter because I don't know right. your case personally. If you want to make an appointment and come in, I'm happy you to You can give some with you. general information yes. in that case, but uh, yeah. you can't really comment without seeing the specifics of what's in that file. Yeah. Okay, so if you can't comment on the specifics of a, of a case, yet you happen to have a blog or part of a forum, uh, you are entitled, I suppose, to give general information. Does that also apply in the same case where you can't address a single specific case in a blog open to the public? on um, you know completely public site is that true or you would be inclined to I'm uncomfortable out? with the blogs right. okay. because if you're blogging uh, unless it's a really general or generic issue like you know what is net negligence or mm -hmm. what's a public nuisance if you start being specific about a particular case I really I'm not comfortable with that right. because the case is coming 
I don't know. I'm, I'm just not if, comfortable if with that. If you have, have anything, careful. you have to make sure that you're saying that this is a hypothetical yeah. situation, that you know, you're not using names of anybody that exists or real people that you represent. None of that can be in a blog. Mm -hmm. I think you could speak in terms of some hypothetical situations and mm -hmm. make sure that you're not disclosing anything that could identify a client or something of mm -hmm. that nature. Mm -hmm. When, how do you avoid the issue about confidentiality when there's been some back and forth, whether it's on the phone or by way of email, Maybe I'm just testing the waters with an email with you to see if maybe you have the background and I feel comfortable enough to engage you or enlist your services. Um, if I'm just just ferreting out some general information about you, there's nothing that's confidential. How do you secure that situation so that from this moment on, I have to maintain confidentiality? Is there a um, way that you, in paperwork or by email, in some way document, this is the point at which I am retained and anything you may or may not say remains between us? Or what is the, what's if we, the procedure? If we meet a client, the minute they come in our office and discuss issues with us, you have your confidentiality. Specific <laughs> issues or just general issues? Even if it's general, whatever they tell us in confidence is, is, you know, has to remain in confidence. Yeah, it goes back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way that mm -hmm. if a husband comes in to see me about a divorce case and doesn't hire me, I still won't take the wife's case if she came in afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is that an ethical issue? Is that sure an outright is. illegal issue? No, it's ethical. It's a, a conflict of interest. Yeah. yeah. Even conflict. though you haven't been retained. Either. That's the way I feel. That's right. Because you've been given information. Um, you know, some other lawyers may have a different opinion on that, but I think once you've oh. taken information from somebody, mm -hmm. um, explore their case with them, whether they hire you or not, that's the end of it. That's why some divorce lawyers started charging a fairly significant consultation fee because they wanted a guard against husbands going around shopping, or wives, shopping mm -hmm. them out of a case. We also have to do what's called a conflicts check. So any new client that we get in the office, uh, we check our database, the yeah. old days that we had to keep We're, an alphabetized right. list. But we had to t check our database to make sure that there's no conflict. So in the case with David, you know, the husband may have come to see him four years ago. He may have not have remembered type it in, type in the name. And it's say, in our computer. It's in our computer. So we're required, as a matter of fact, our malpractice carrier requires us to right. do that as well. And while we're speaking of that, and these questions that I have been based on some clients or those who've served as clients and asked these mm -hmm. issues about lawyers, how about from a business standpoint where maybe you are the attorney for and incorporated the business initially and there are a couple of partners and there's disputes and one hires you. Um, the corporation had you do their business. Mm -hmm. Now one or the other of the lawyers needs some help. How does that play out? Can you take care of one mm -hmm. or either or neither? Yeah, I think you have the same conflict issue. Right. The corporation is a separate entity. Mm -hmm. Once you represent the corporation, that's the entity you're representing. You can't now represent a partner in a dispute against the corporation or the other partner. You're best served sending both of them to someone else. Yeah, yeah. That's good for people to know in case. Yeah. Would that be the case also if they weren't incorporated but one went to you and had a um, sole proprietorship and then had someone that they wanted to partner with? Could you still represent that person who initially started the business? As long as we didn't handle anything relative to the partnership. Right, yeah. and you can represent them in the formation of the partnership, yeah. but if there's this dispute, I would say that you couldn't represent either one at that point. Good to know. Now, while I've been asking you questions about some that uh, cases that have come up, do you have specific thoughts about um, ethics violations or things that were gray areas well, that cross your mind? One thing I think people should know is there's a difference between an ethical violation and malpractice. Someone can we do... We haven't gone there, have no, we? No, but yeah. someone yeah. can do something that's absolutely ethical and, and, and do their job, but have not done it up to the standard that they're supposed to do it to as a you know, seasoned attorney, and that might result in a malpractice claim, but it's not necessarily an ethics claim. Sometimes they can merge. Um, Jackie was talking about somebody who may have an inappropriate relationship with a client. Mm -hmm. Well, if that inappropriate relationship with a client, which is an ethical violation, affects how they handled a case, then they may also have a malpractice claim against them. Mm -hmm. In which case, if you happen to be the client and feel that you're on the short end of that stick, 
and lost, perhaps because of uh, the lawyer's malpractice, would they still go to disciplinary board or is there another procedure that that would follow? If it's malpractice? If they think it's malpractice. Uh, then you would uh, put their put the attorney on notice that you believe they've committed malpractice. The attorney then notifies his or her insurance carrier and the insurance company takes it from Yeah, you probably go to another attorney yeah, yeah. and say, I've got a malpractice claim against this attorney and he would look into it. If he felt there was one, he'd send a letter of representation like you might in any other case mm -hmm. and proceed. So there would be two avenues in that particular kind of case you might pursue. You might be pursuing the malpractice claim, which is to receive a monetary settlement for how you, the damage you suffered as a result of the malpractice. Mm -hmm. And you may also have a complaint about the ethical violation to the disciplinary council. Mm -hmm. But again, stressing that these things um, do come up, uh, but it is a small proportion of attorneys that you see involved in this yeah. type kind of thing. Considering we started out talking about um, ethics issues and someone perhaps filing a complaint and going through this process, is, do you have any sense based on what goes on in Rhode Island or even Southeastern Mass about what is a reasonable length of time for which this would play, during which this would play out? Would it take one week, six months, a year and a half? For a complaint to turn around? To turn around. It, it depends. It could take months. Yeah, I would say months. Uh, or um, the council might get a complaint, and as you say, they ferret it out, and there may be no action that's taken. And maybe in s a couple of weeks, you yeah. might get something back from disciplinary council right. saying, we've reviewed it, and we believe there's no ethical violation. If, there, if it's um, something that's determined not to be a violation, you might see the complaint file, then they send it to the attorney and there's a time frame for the attorney to respond, which is going to give them enough time to make an appropriate response. And then it may go back another round. So even if it's determined there is no violation, it could still take several months. If we're dealing with money too, the attorney is going to have to produce financial documents right. and they want everything. It yeah. could go back a substantial mm -hmm. period of time. So I could even go longer. And speaking about that financial situation where a, a lawyer takes uh, money in escrow, they settled the account. How long should it, uh, someone expect they should have to wait before they get their legal bills paid, their, their medical bills paid, or they get that money well, back that's before actually, they should raise a it's flag? It's an interesting and difficult situation sometimes, mm -hmm. especially with Medicare. If you have a case where you're receiving Medicare benefits and they paid some of your bills, We've had cases go 18 months before Medicare responds with a final number in longer. Um, if it's just to pay doctor bills that are known and quantified, that should be done right away. Immediately, yeah. What, the, what I used to do is just pay the doctor bill, make a copy yeah. of the check and a copy of the bill, and give it to the client so they uh, know that it's Our normal paid. process yeah. for a personal injury claim, automobile accident, for example, is someone comes in, they treat, they get better, we make a demand, we settle the case. When the check comes in, we deposit it in our escrow account. And then after it clears, we write a check to the client, our check for the fee, and all the outstanding medical bills. Yeah. Well, that wraps it up. Well, I'm glad that we got to cover as much as we did on this case. So thank you. We once again thank you for tuning in. We thank Jackie and David for being with us um, from Wadette Bazaar. You. Cadero Grasso Law Firm. I think we also need to thank Jesse Dufault, which we don't do often enough, at Full Channel TV, our producer, our very capable producer. If you have questions about this topic or others, certainly you can go to a website, or perhaps you might want to su uh, suggest a topic or two. We invite you to do that at Legal Matters full ch at FullChannelTV.net. Thank you for watching. We hope you'll be with us in our next session as our discussion of Legal Matters continues.